Many of us know that the Cape Fear River was really important in Fayetteville's early development in colonial times. But did you know that during the Civil War, the Cape Fear River was also crucial to the Confederacy's war efforts? I'm Joseph Westendorf, a local and state history librarian here at the Cumberland County Public Library. And over these next few videos, we will chart the Civil War history of the Cape Fear and focus on a few surprising events on the Cape Fear River relating to the Cape Fear ports of the Civil War. At 202 miles long, the Cape Fear River is the only river in North Carolina to empty out into the Atlantic Ocean. It starts just below Jordan Lake between Lee and Chatham counties and winds its way all the way down to Wilmington. Its importance led to the development of many settlements by the Cape Fear River, such as Fayetteville. This gave the Cape Fear important strategic value to the Confederacy during the Civil War, as the Cape Fear allows for goods to come into Wilmington and to follow the Cape Fear up into the rest of the state. The Cape Fear River was also strategically important because of its close proximity to Wilmington and the Wilmington Railroads. Wilmington was the largest city in North Carolina at the start of the Civil War with around 10,000 people. The Cape Fear River flowed by Wilmington and the Wilmington and Weldon Railroad, which was the longest railroad on the planet when it was built in 1840, ran right from Wilmington all the way into Virginia. That rail line became instrumental in transporting supplies and men to the front of the war in Northern Virginia. The Wilmington and Weldon Railroad was even called by some as the lifeline of the Confederacy. This, along with Wilmington's key location, being only 25 miles north of the Cape Fear's confluence with the Atlantic Ocean, made Wilmington really important. Wilmington was out of the range of any Union bombardment, but its proximity to the Cape Fear allowed it to receive goods from blockade runners, allowing it to become the gate to the Confederacy. At the start of the war, Union General-in-Chief Winfield Scott suggested that to defeat the rebellion, it was necessary to strangle the South through a blockade along their coastline. His plan was criticized by those who wanted an aggressive war against the Confederacy, and they mockingly called it the Anaconda Plan due to its perceived slowness. Nevertheless, his plan was slowly implemented by the North and proved crucial to victory. For instance, in 1861, the first year of the war, almost 2,000 ships ran the blockade at the port cities of Wilmington and Charleston at a 97% success rate. However, by 1863 and 1864, just under 400 ships made it through the blockade to Wilmington. One step the Union took in implementing the blockade was by seizing control of North Carolina's long coastline. In the summer of 1861, they started to move against the Outer Banks, and by early 1862, Union forces had seized Fort Macon, New Bern, and a chunk of the eastern coast of North Carolina, which they would hold for the remainder of the war. Yet the Union mistakenly overlooked Wilmington. Union officials were more concerned with bigger ports, especially Charleston, which was the seat of the rebellion. Wilmington, on the other hand, was just a small port compared to New Orleans, Charleston, and Savannah, so it was overlooked. So Wilmington grew into a crucial port for the Confederacy, while the Union was busy focusing on Charleston and other ports. And as long as Wilmington remained uncaptured, it was a lifeline for the Confederacy. When Charleston fell, Wilmington became even more important. By late 1864, 
it was the last major Confederate seaport open and was providing General Lee's army with half of their food supply. Wilmington and the Cape Fear were linked together. That's why the Cape Fear fort system was very important to the war effort. There were numerous defensive structures along the Cape Fear, at least 23, ranging from Fort Caswell at the bottom of Old Inlet to Fort Booth up in Cumberland County. However, most of the fortifications were around Wilmington, guarding the lifeline of the Confederacy. Specifically, fortifications such as Fort Fisher, Fort Caswell, and Fort Johnston, along with smaller forts such as Fort Campo and Fort Holmes. However, they all faced a recurring problem throughout the war by not having enough manpower to operate them. Fort Johnston was located near Smithville, which is now Southport, and was the oldest fortification in the Carolinas, having been built by the British during the 1740s. It guarded the channel and the land approaches to Fort Fisher. However, it was a very small and poorly constructed fort when the war began. Perhaps the most important forts on the Cape Fear were the ones that guarded the inlets to the Cape Fear River. The inlets were far enough apart that there needed to be substantial fortifications at each inlet. Forts Caswell, Camper, and Holmes were at the old inlet and guarded that passageway. Fort Caswell on Oak Island had been designed as part of the U.S.'s coastal defense after the War of 1812. Fort Holmes was built by the Confederates on Bald Head Island to guard the island and the inlet. There was also artillery batteries guarding the area, such as Battery Shaw on Oak Island. Fort Fisher, the Gibraltar of the South, was the most important fortification upon the Cape Fear. It was located at the New Inlet, which is called New because a hurricane created it in September 1761. Fort Fisher guarded the new inlet for blockade runners, such as Captain John Newland Moffat, a blockade runner who used to live in Fayetteville. Fort Fisher did not exist at the start of the war, but had been slowly built by the Confederates, being mostly completed by 1863. Together, these forts kept the Cape Fear open to traffic through early 1865, providing a valuable role in sustaining the Confederacy's war effort. Mm -hmm.